Did you know that according to experts, there are four main types of serial killers based on motives alone. There are those who kill because they feel like they have a mission to rid society of a certain group of people. Then there are those who kill for power and control. There are those who believe an otherworldly presence or entity has commanded them to kill. And then there are those who kill purely for their own personal pleasure. But what happens when a serial killer cannot be classified? What happens when a perpetrator doesn't just have one single modus operandi or victim profile? How do you even attempt to piece together a puzzle to catch the face behind the trail of destruction when you don't even have all the pieces? Today I will be discussing one such killer. A man who used five different methods of killing. A man who did not pursue just one kind of victim. A man who remains a terrifying enigma. This is the case of one of the most cold-blooded serial killers South Africa has ever known, Cedric Markey. Hello and welcome to Serial September, a Bala Monsoon exclusive production. This month I will be delving into the minds behind the serial murders that shocked the nation. I also just want to say a quick thank you for joining me last month, Women's Month, to share in the narratives and remember the stories of strong and brave women, many of whom unfortunately did not live to tell their tale themselves. If you miss those episodes, you can catch them in my Women's Month playlist. For those of you who are new, let me introduce myself. And for those of you who are returning, it's good to see you again and please feel free to skip ahead to the good stuff. So here it is in a nutshell. I'm a mental health professional who just so happens to be obsessed with makeup, true crime, and the motives that drive people to do what they do. So what this means is that every single week I post a brand new video looking at a real life crime from a psychological viewpoint. During these episodes, I also try to share psychological knowledge and concepts that you may or may not know in an easy to understand format. So if all of that sounds like something that is right up your alley, then please do consider subscribing and joining the Balibu family. But if you're more a fan of podcasts and would not like to see my face all day, no worries, I got you covered. You can find me for my sister podcast, Murder and Mayhem, South African True Crime, available on all major streaming channels. And for those who want to find me quick fast, you can just scan the code on screen now. Just a quick disclaimer for today's episode. Today's episode contains material citing murder as well as sexual assault. As always, I mean absolutely no disrespect to any of the victims mentioned nor their families. The purpose of this video is to shed further light on the heinous crimes that were committed whilst spreading awareness about the psychological nature of the narrative. This episode has been thoroughly researched by myself and includes real life accounts, video and footage where available of individuals involved directly in the case. So without further delay, let's get on to it. Cedric Marke was born on the 10th of September 1963 in the Guiani area of Limpopo. Limpopo, although one of the most beautiful provinces in South Africa, is also one of the poorest. As with some of the other individuals I discuss on this channel, not much is known about his childhood and early years. He was, however, the youngest of four children. His mother was his father's second wife, and both families lived on the same property. Polygamy is actually legal in South Africa. T's and C's apply. Have a look at the Customary Marriages Act for more information on this. And it is not uncommon within many different cultures here for men to have multiple wives. Another key aspect of the culture that he grew up in was the process of initiation. Cedric's most prominent and also the only trauma that he would ever disclose was that surrounding his initiation which he would later describe as barbaric. Now, for those of you who aren't aware, there is often much contention around initiation ceremonies, as well as the initiation schools that exist around the country. As someone who is not intimately involved in a culture that partakes in initiation ceremonies, 
I can only speak to what I have come across and read in my research. So initiation ceremonies and schools focus on the cultural transformation of young men and women into adults. They are said to focus on the values, principles, hardships, respect and accountability within their particular cultural upbringings. Within each different culture, the aspects taught and the program provided differ slightly. Girls and boys are split up. The young men will then spend time in the bush, away from civilization, to learn how to be upstanding men in society. During this time, many of the boys are also circumcised by traditional Sangomas. Unfortunately though, many of these initiation ceremonies have not been regulated, and the initiation schools have not been registered. For this reason, death due to dehydration, malnutrition and septic wounds as well as injuries have been noted, with many of these boys being subjected not only to traditional chants and rituals but also to humiliation and abuse. Like I said though, I do not have first-hand knowledge of this, so I can only go off the experience of others that I have read as well as the research that exists. The rituals themselves are extremely secretive and information is tightly guarded by the communities who practice them. For Cedric in particular, his experience at the age of 12 or 13 years old stuck with him for the years to follow. He stated that he had to live in the felt for three months without clean water or food. This could very well be accurate as initiation ceremonies are said to last anywhere from one week to six months. After Cedric had returned home from that ordeal, it would be just a few years later when he was in grade 10 that his father had passed away. It was at this point that he stated that himself and his mother became second class citizens within their own home. This would lead to him deciding to leave school shortly after that and he would move to Johannesburg in search of work. He would soon take on painting and gardening jobs, his employers trusting him implicitly. And later, he became a plumber. One of his brothers, however, would go on to become a police sergeant, a completely different path to the one that he would soon follow. As an adult, he married a woman from Guiani, Sophie, but he also had a girlfriend in Johannesburg. And all in all, he was the father to four children. And so our narrative takes us to when he was 33 years old and living in La Rochelle in Johannesburg with his wife. He was a perfect, quiet tenant, and not even his wife had any clue of what he was truly capable of. And this is the point where his crime spree began. Prepare yourself, because this is a long, disturbing, and hella bumpy ride. As I mentioned previously, Cedric did not follow just one modus operandi, but instead five. And so his crime spree will be chronologically ordered and categorized according to these MOs. These initial set of crimes that I'm about to detail would later be known as the Hammer series. On the 28th of December 1996, Antonio Alfonso was working at Hill Extension Gardens Cafe in High Street, Rosettenville. It was during his shift when Cedric had entered the shop, attacked him with a hammer, and then proceeded to steal 400 rand from him. Antonio luckily survived the attack, but Cedric was just getting started. On the 6th of January 1997, just eight days later, at around 10 a.m. in the morning, Magan Kanji, a 78-year-old male and the owner of a tailor shop in Madison Street, Jeppy, was alone in his shop. Cedric had entered the shop, claiming to be a plumber and wanting to purchase a second-hand pair of trousers. Kanji had then helped him and gave him a pair to try on. After doing so, Cedric had lashed out at him, striking him in the left eye with a shifting spanner. After leaving the man injured and disorientated with no further memory of the incident, Cedric had left, taking five pairs of trousers with him. Luckily, Kanji made it to hospital, spending a week there surviving but never making a full recovery to normal health. Two days later, on the 8th of January, Cedric then struck at the Terminus Butchery in Troyville. His next victim would be Kenny Chan, whom he bludgeoned with a hammer and robbed of cash before leaving. 
Kenny would also luckily survive the attack. Nine days later, on the 17th of January, Cedric had entered Vallop Brothers in Dornfontein at 10.30am in the morning. The man behind the counter, Kantilal Lachman, who was 56 years old at the time, had assisted him after Cedric had claimed that he wanted alterations done on two pairs of pants. I wouldn't even be surprised or put it past him if these trousers were actually part of the stolen merchandise from his previous incident at Kanji's store. As the alterations were being done, Cedric sat in the shop waiting for the work to be complete. He then added that he wanted to buy a pair of shoes, and so he had paid a deposit under the name Patrick Maquena. After this, he promptly took out his hammer, but he didn't attack him just yet. Instead, he told him that the head of his hammer was loose, probably from his last attack on Kenny Chan, no how. Lachman had then directed him to a hardware store. And off he went, he got the hammer fixed and he returned, stating that now he also wanted to buy underwear. And as the gentleman behind the counter turned his back on Cedric to get the items for him, Cedric attacked him with the hammer. I'm sorry, but can we please take a moment to just think of the audacity of this man? Right, so then he stole Lutchman's wallet and for some reason he had left the hammer in the shop. Lutchman would later survive but would suffer multiple skull fractures as well as a clot on the brain. And Cedric, well, he was just warming up. Just five days later, on the 22nd of January, another shop owner, Abdul Samad Bulbalia, was targeted in his shop in Newtown. He was attacked with a hammer and Cedric had stolen his wallet containing 600 rand. Abdul survived the ordeal. Up until this point, every single one of Cedric's victims had survived. But that was going to change. The next day, the 23rd of January, in Von Veilich Street, downtown Johannesburg, Dansuklal Takur Patel was attacked with a hammer. And like the others before him, had his wallet stolen by Cedric. Patel, however, although rushed to hospital, would pass away that very same day. And thus, he would also become the first known victim, murdered by Cedric Marke. February rolled around, and on the 26th, David Sadka, working in a pawn shop in Yeovil, was, you guessed it, attacked with a hammer and had his wallet containing his credit cards and cash stolen from him by Cedric. He would go on to survive the attack. The next morning, the 27th of February, Amrat Lale Gopal, who was 63 years old at the time, was opening his shoe repair store in Von Veilich Street when two men had entered his shop. This would be a deviation in behavior, as it is quite uncommon for serial killers to gain an accomplice along the way. But yet, here he was. Gopal had his wallet stolen and he would suffer brain damage, unable to ever recall what had actually occurred that day, but he would survive the attack. Almost a month later, on the 26th of March, Cedric had then targeted a butchery in Delray Street, Friededorp, where he attacked the man there with a hammer and stole 900 rand. Another month later, around lunchtime on the 22nd of April, Yogi Dera of Jay's Wholesalers in Commissioner Street had made the mistake of turning his back on a customer, Cedric, who had then attacked him with a hammer. A fight had ensued as Dera fought for his life, which resulted in Cedric fleeing, leaving behind his shoes, which he had taken off to get repaired, as well as a bag of clothing. Unfortunately, the clothing was then sold by Yogi, so it was unable to be collected for evidence. Some may wonder why he did that, instead of handing it over to the police, but I think you would have to put yourself into his shoes in order to fully understand. You see, this crime was just one of many that had occurred in such a short period of time in areas so very close to one another, sometimes even the same street. But yet, the police had failed to do much to try and stop this incredibly dangerous perpetrator. The tailors and shop owners of the area, mostly Indian, were terrified and some had even closed up shop and left. But yet, there would be no leads or progress made in any investigations into this brutal perpetrator. So, it would seem apparent that trust in the police and the police work 
would not have been that high at the time. So as I mentioned before, this series of crimes became known as the Hammer series. The investigation into these crimes was not coordinated and different police branches were looking into the different cases. And just five days after that last encounter, potentially quite shaken, Cedric had changed his modus operandi. Now, for those of you who are well-versed in serial killer knowledge, yes, yes, that is a thing, Changing modus operandi is not really the norm for majority of serial killers. But then again, Cedric would turn out to be far from your normal or average serial offender. On the 27th of April, Cedric began to target couples in the Wemapan area. Wemapan is a lake and recreational area in La Rochelle. Yes, pretty close to where Cedric was living at the time. It was also an area known to be a lover's lane or lake of sorts, where couples would park off to chat, spend some time together, or have clandestine meetings. One such couple was Montu Elijah Tlatswayo, who was 58 years old at the time, and his partner Yunus Kozapanzi. They were sitting in his vehicle next to the N17 highway, when Cedric had shot Montu in the back with a 9mm pistol. He had then stolen his wallet and he had dragged Yunus to a nearby mine dump where he had then shot her too. Whether he had sexually assaulted her before killing her could never be definitively established. He did however go on to and kill another woman that he had met later that evening. He had struck her multiple times with a rock. Her identity was never discovered and her face was unrecognizably battered. And with these three murders, he began what would come to be known as the Wemmer Pan series and his second modus operandi. But for the time being, he had decided to change MOs again. And so the taxi series began, what would be known as his third modus operandi. On the 25th of May, he had entered Sipo in Dima's taxi. Upon reaching Compound Road in Springfield, very close to Wemma Pan, he had threatened Ndima with a firearm, robbed him of 300 rand, shot him several times, and then left the scene. In the following month, he then robbed Michael Mkeze in his taxi. Once again, quite close to Springfield and Wemapan. This time, he got away with 150 rand, Mkeze's watch and shoes, and he shot the man twice. Mkeze, however, would live. Later that month, Cedric would revert back to his second modus operandi and he would resume his Wemapan attacks. On the 14th of June, Ralph Jeremiah Nguenya, who was 49 years old at the time, and his partner Christina Mashejo, who was 42 years old at the time, were targeted and attacked. Ralph was shot twice in the back and later died whilst paramedics tried to resuscitate him. Christina was found dead on the scene. Cedric had her and shot her several times. And just two days later, for the fourth time, Cedric's modus operandi would change. Yeah, I kid you not. He ditched his calculated attacks and he simply began attacking people walking in the street. And so began the pedestrian series. On that day, on the 16th of June, he attacked and shot Dora Duduzele Tlatla as she was jogging along the Soweto Highway at Crown Mines. On the 21st of June, Cedric approached three individuals walking in Rivalier, which was near to Wemapan. He then pulled out a firearm, fatally wounding the male individual and causing the two females to flee. He then stole the deceased male, Sonti Simon Mohokoni's shoes, 20 rand, and his ID document. And so you may wonder, after all of these attacks, where were the police? Well, firstly, keep in mind that all of these attacks had not been linked to the same person as of yet. There were two separate investigations underway, one for the Wemapan spate of attacks and the other for the hammer attacks in downtown Johannesburg. In July of 1997, a special investigation team was established under the leadership of the one and only Captain Pete Bailefeld. If you're familiar with my content, you would have definitely heard me talk about him before. When Bailefeld entered the investigation, he immediately knew, as someone who had the reputation of being an investigator of serial killings, that he was indeed dealing with a serial killer. 
but little did he know what would await him. So whilst the police and the detectives worked to discover the identity of these attackers, Cedric had reverted to his Wemapan modus operandi. On the 11th of July, he attacked Jerry Kanya Naidu, who was 44 years old at the time, and his companion Charlotte Ndlovu, who was 28 years old at the time, whilst the two of them were sitting in their vehicle. Naidu was kind enough to assist Cedric in questions he had about a cell phone, but as he was distracted, he was shot and fatally wounded in his chest and stomach. Cedric then dragged Charlotte out of the vehicle and pistol whipped her. He robbed her of her leather jacket, spectacles and watch and he forced her to walk a short distance from the vehicle. He then told her to entice a taxi driver to approach them but she managed to actually get into the taxi and escape. He had then robbed Naidu of his wallet and disappeared. And Cedric wasted no time in moving on to another victim. At around 5pm the next evening, he encountered another couple, Moses, who was 35 years old, and Dokas, who was 26 years old. He shot Moses twice in the back, ending his life instantly. After taking his wallet, he then forced Dorcas to walk into the woods. It was at this stage that he had pointed to a homeless man who happened to be in the area at the time and he had told her that he was working with this man. But this was not the truth though. He had no idea who this man was and chances are he was a bit stressed out that he had encountered someone else during his attack. The thing about Cedric though is that he was incredibly quick-witted and he knew how to manipulate a situation. And that is exactly what he did. He leveraged his victim's fear against them. He then made her remove her clothing and proceeded to rape her twice. But wait, it gets even more twisted, if you can believe it. Instead of ending her life as he had done with the woman before her, he had given her a few rands for taxi fare and then he had tried to arrange a date with her. Wait, what? And if that wasn't bad enough, he had then casually asked her if she would be attending her boyfriend's funeral. Yes, the man he had killed just minutes prior. Yeah, I'm gonna give that a moment to sink in. Thankfully, she got away and out of that situation and she took a taxi home. And four days later, on the 16th of July, Cedric was back at it, accosting Stanley Spielmann Holobe, who was 26 years old, and his partner, Emily Madiba. He forced them at gunpoint out of their parked vehicle and into the woods. And then, once again, things took a turn for the twisted. He instructed both of them to get undressed and engage in intercourse with one another whilst he watched. He then proceeded to steal Stanley's wallet, told the pair to get dressed and walk further into the woods. Stanley managed to get away, but Emily was not as lucky. Cedric proceeded to rape Emily and then shot her twice in the chest. He then stole her leather jacket and absconded. Emily, however, would miraculously survive. After this latest attack, Bailafel decided to try and bait the attacker, and so he sat with a female police officer in their vehicle at Wemapan for the majority of the day, waiting for him to attack. However, after about eight to nine hours of absolutely no action whatsoever, it was starting to get dark, and Bailafeld began to fear for the safety of his companion. And so they had pulled away from the Wemapan area. And it was not soon after that that they heard via radio that a man had been slowly moving up the mine dump, approaching their vehicle. But in the dark, it was unfortunately too hard and too late to try and catch him. And it would later turn out that Cedric knew exactly who was in that vehicle and he was extremely angry that he had missed his opportunity to strike. And so, on the 18th of July, it was back to the streets for Cedric. Perhaps it was the anger of Stanley escaping, combined with that ill-fated encounter with Bailafelt, because on this day, he released a fury like no other. He approached 25-year-old Samuel Moleme and his friend Catherine Laquena. He pulled a firearm on them and he attempted to rob Samuel, who put up a fight. He then shot him three times in the head and shot Catherine in the knee. But instead of fleeing, he then dragged her into the felt and raped her twice before leaving the scene. 
He then proceeded to Claremont, around five kilometers away. Here he came across David John Duplessis and his girlfriend Sarah Lingpane. He then proceeded to shoot and kill David, Sarah and then shoot her too. Before he left the scene, he had stolen David's shoes and his night was not over yet. Just before midnight, he encountered another couple, just a few roads away. The pair were Martin Stander, who was 19 years old, and Lilani van Veik, who was 15 years old. They were sitting on a wall, minding their own business, on their way home from their evening out. Cedric shot Martin in the head, Lilani, and then ended her life, and then robbed both of their corpses of their jewellery and clothing. By the end of his night, he had brutally attacked five individuals, and Lilani would be his youngest victim yet. On the 26th of July, Henil Mampuele Motuetsi and his companion Doris Pimla Mangapela were walking along Boyson's Reserve Road when they were confronted by Cedric and an unknown man. The men had demanded money from the couple, but when there was resistance, Henil was attacked and Doris was dragged into the felt and brutally attacked with a stone, ending her life. Cedric then stole her pants as well as her shoes. The very next month, he reverted to his initial modus operandi, the Hammer series. His next victim would be Luvio Vuitton, who was 64 years old and was working in Livio's shoe repairs in Jeppe. Cedric had approached him, asked him to repair shoes, and then returned the next day to collect them. However, he had then inquired about belts, and whilst Luvio was preoccupied, he had produced a hammer and he had hit the man in the face. He then left the scene, leaving a bag containing shoe polish, an empty wallet, and a pair of shoes. However, like the previous victim, Luvio had sold these belongings. Just before 8am on the 16th of August, Natvarlal Gangaran, a 53-year-old man, opened SK Taylor's in Turfontein. One minute he was switching on an iron to press a pair of trousers and in the next he was being attacked from behind with a hammer. Cedric then took his wallet and left. The man survived. Three days later, on the 19th of August, at around 10.30 in the morning, Isop Hassin was in Corolia stores when he was brutally attacked by Cedric. He was later found on the floor. He ended up spending a long time in hospital and although he survived, he could not remember anything about the attack. Ten days later, Cedric struck yet again. At 7 in the morning on the 29th of August, Kanu Parbu, a 56-year-old man, opened KB Patel Taylor's in Yeovil. The same chain of events is thought to have occurred, with Kanu being struck with a hammer and robbed of his wallet. We cannot know for certainty though exactly what went down, as he would unfortunately never regain consciousness and he died just under a month later as a result of the wounds sustained in the attack. About two weeks went by, and on the 14th of September, Cedric attacked Abdul Hamed Karim at SA Wholesalers in Fordsburg. He survived the attack, but of course, his wallet and cash were stolen. Five days later, on the 19th of September, at around 10.15 in the morning, Harjavan Thayer, a 75-year-old man who worked at Indaya Taylor's in Fordsburg, was attacked by Cedric after re-entering his shop after a bathroom break. He survived, but you guessed it, his wallet and a bag of clothing were stolen. Cedric struck again on the 4th of October. His victim was Mohammed Akoji Ibrahim, who worked at the Badat stores in La Rochelle. His body was discovered with neck and head wounds, and unfortunately, he would pass away in hospital that very same day. Cedric had also stolen cash from his shop. Cedric then lay in wait, and 10 days later, on the 14th of October, he attacked Jacinto Mendez Serrano in his shop, the Good Hope Cafe in Turfontein. He unfortunately would not survive that ordeal, and later that day in hospital would pass away. And almost as though he was growing restless and bored, Cedric would enter his fifth and final modus operandi stage. This time, the name of the game was attacking someone in their own home. He began on the 15th of October, just one day after Serrano's murder, and he entered the home of Jose Armando Vieira de Gers in Regent's Park. 
After stabbing him to death, he made off with a video recorder, a TV set, a pair of shoes, keys, and a wallet containing some cash. But just three days later, he reverted to his Hammer series, and he would begin to switch back and forth over the next few weeks. On the 18th of October, he attacked Eduardo Augusto, the owner of Soweto Wholesalers in Boysons. He had asked him for a plastic bag, and as Eduardo had bent down to get one, Cedric had struck him with a hammer. He then stole the cash register, which contained 500 rand, his ID document, and a further 30 rand from Eduardo. Eduardo would survive. About a week later in the morning at around 11 a.m. on the 25th of October, Mahesh Jairam Valab, who was 36 years old, was at work at Jay's Tailors when Cedric entered the store with a woman. Yes, this was a strange turn of events as once again he had brought another accomplice or witness into the equation. He claimed he wanted to buy underwear and whilst Mahesh was distracted, he had attacked him with a hammer and then proceeded to steal around 500 rand. Mahesh would survive the attack. Another week or so went by. And on the 4th of November, at around 6am, Anil Mehta was dropped off at his shop in Protea Shopping Center Brixton and unfortunately encountered Cedric. Two hours later, his bloodied body was seen through the window of the locked shop. He unfortunately passed away on the scene. His watch and wallet were stolen. On the 7th of November, Cedric reverted once again to his home invasion series. He entered Arthur William McIntyre's house in South Hills and ended his life with a hammer. He then stole a video machine, portable radio, jewelry, clothing, and a .38 revolver. Later that day, he went to Victoria Fashions in Rosettenville and was faced this time with two individuals within the shop. That, however, did not deter Cedric, and he attacked both of them with a hammer before robbing them. Tuan Yang Chao unfortunately died the following day, but Chi Chao survived. A week later, at Boston Taylor's in Commissioner Street, he entered the shop, brutally attacked Takur Ranchod with a hammer, robbed him of his cash, and absconded. Takur died five days later in hospital. That, however, would be the last of his Hammer series of murders. Why, you may ask? Well, after all of these incidents, there was massive public pressure from the Asian community to find the culprit. And so, Bailefeld had been assigned to the case. Yes, the very same Bailefeld who was investigating the Wemmer Pan series of murders. Now remember, at this stage, no one had pieced together that these two series of murders were connected, because of course, the modus operandis differed as well as the victim profiles. Right, so Pete Bailefeld was on the case, and he thought that it might be useful to keep all the tailor shops in central Johannesburg under observation, as they seemed to be the target of the attacks. And this might have been a brilliant plan, if it wasn't for what happened next. So, as I mentioned, the community were not impressed with the police work, or rather, lack of police work that had been done up until this point. In particular, the Asian community, who, quite rightly so, felt targeted by these attacks. And so they decided to take matters into their own hands, and they spoke to the press. Within days, victim accounts, names, modus operandi, and stores had been splashed, along with other details of the investigation, all over the front pages. Yes, irresponsible journalism at its finest. Look, I know I am a true crime creator myself, but there is a big reason why it is important to let cases go through the relevant procedures before making statements or speaking publicly on them. Also, disclosing the names and addresses of the victims during an open investigation in which the perpetrator has not been caught yet seems a lot on the X side for me. Some information can really just jeopardize a case, which is exactly what happened. 
Cedric committed not one more hammer murder after the news broke in the media. He did, however, return to three of his other MOs. First, he targeted Gerard Levu, an elderly Portuguese man, on the 28th of November as he was cycling amongst the trees at Wimapan. Cedric fatally shot him in the back and stole his bicycle, which he later sold at a pawn shop. On the 12th of December, 40-year-old Mini Jacob Inglabende and his friend Tandi Ndaba were relaxing at their shack at the Blue Dam in Homestead Park when Cedric approached them pretending to be a police officer. He then searched through their belongings and he ordered them to follow him to his vehicle. He then took out his firearm and whilst holding Mini at gunpoint, he Tandi in the bush. He proceeded to shoot many multiple times. That same night, he was not satisfied yet, and so he opted for a home invasion, entering the home of Cyril Norman Slattery in Turfontaine and killing him with a hammer before stealing his television set. Two days later, Enoch Ngoma, who was 25 years old, and his partner, Deliwe Ngogela, who was 24 years old, were walking through the felt in Moffat View when Cedric approached and accosted them with a firearm. He then ordered them to remove their clothing and have intercourse with one another whilst he watched. He attacked Enoch with a rock and raped Deliwe. But as he had done once before, he let her go, after she said that she would not identify him. Both of them survived and Cedric ran away after robbing Enoch of his clothing. And over 50 brutal attacks later, Cedric was coming to the end of his spree. But he didn't know that yet. On the 19th of December at around 8pm, Mongani Gama and Ntomba Futi Omalo were walking through Pioneer Park in La Rochelle. Cedric approached them from behind, shot Bongani in the back and took 180 rand from him. He forced the female companion to Wema Pan where he proceeded to rape her. He dragged her to the top of a nearby kopi and proceeded to rape her yet again. But he wasn't done with her just yet. He forced her to continue walking with him, and then they had encountered two men. Cedric fired at the one man, Richmond Tembalabo Fabana, wounding him. He then robbed him of his tackies. The terrified woman was forced to go with him to Faraday Station in Village, Maine, where he raped her for the third time. He finally let her go. And get this, he told her that she was lucky that he did not kill her. Little did Cedric know that Bailefeld and his team were closing in on him. Bailefeld and his team received a tip-off, which described a suspicious man lurking at a local hotel, a man who was not a guest or a patron there. This tip-off further elaborated that he was often seen in the same clothing, green trousers and a grey jersey. They would later suspect that he was dating a woman who stayed and worked at a dog parlor not too far away. They had intel on both him and his girlfriend, Angelina Tlapane, who was working at a local dog parlor. After following her one day, she led them straight to the man they were looking for. And so finally, on the 23rd of December, 1997, after an extensive and brilliant investigation by Captain Bailefelt and his team, Cedric was arrested at a taxi rank in central Johannesburg. He said not a word. Not the greatest Christmas present, I would say. The small, thin, fresh-faced man, as described by the local newspaper, was incredibly unsuspecting. He was then charged with the Wemma Pan series of attacks. Blood samples were taken from him and they matched the DNA found at multiple Wemma Pan crime scenes. During the course of the investigation, Bailefeld had questioned Cedric and later tracked the pawn shop, Billy's Pawn Shop, who bought one of the victim's items, Lavu's bicycle. The name on that receipt was Patrick Maquena, the very same name that was linked to a receipt that was found in one of the Hammer series attacks. And so, as the cogs turned in his mind, Bailefeld realized that he had not only the Wemmer Pan killer, but also the Hammer series murderer. Cedric had silently nodded when he was asked whether he had been involved in attacks in the Jeppy area, 
which is where majority of the hammer attacks had taken place. Locked up, Cedric was not a happy camper. And at one point, he became so agitated that he was throwing his own feces at the gods, screaming insults and hurling abuse. Bailafelt had come out in the middle of the night to try and calm him down, and he had ended up spending three hours with him. Three hours that Cedric spent swearing. But during this conversation, it emerged that Cedric had not only a softer spot for his wife, but also a soft spot for his mother. And so, like any good detective would, Bailafeld used this information to his advantage. Cedric ended up taking the police to more than 40 crime scenes, as well as back to Gianni to his mother's home, where some of the clothing and shoes he had taken from his victims were stored. I guess he thought that was a safe place for his trophies. On the way back to the station from his distraught mother's home in Gianni, Bailafeld managed to get on Cedric's apparent good side. This led to a sudden desire for him to show Bailafeld where he had hidden his pistol. And so in the pitch dark and pouring rain at about 10.30 in the evening, they had stopped in Wemapan. Even in the darkness, Cedric made his way quite quickly to the spot. And in a matter of seconds, Bailafeld realized that they had potentially walked into a trap. But he was on guard, and before Cedric had the chance to make use of the pistol, it was bagged and he was taken back to the station. Unfortunately for him, not even a bribe from his police sergeant brother, a 500 rand, mind you, was going to get him out of the trouble he was in. In April of 1998, Cedric Marquez's trial began. He faced 133 charges, and there were more than 300 witnesses who came forward to give testimony and information. Over the 358 days that followed, evidence was heard and victims were given a platform to share their experience. Although some of the victims were left brain damaged, they were only required to say the name of their business and where they had incurred their injury whether it was on the left ear or right ear. It was really just a formality to prove that a crime had been committed. And then on the 16th of March 2000, Justice Geraldine Borches found Cedric Marque guilty on 27 counts of murder, 26 counts of attempted murder, 41 counts of robbery with aggravating circumstances, 1 count of attempted robbery, 14 counts of one count of assault with grievous bodily harm, three counts of illegal possession of a firearm, and one count of illegal possession of ammunition. That last count was as a result of Cedric having in his possession when he was arrested a single bullet. And so he was handed 27 life sentences, and altogether with the other charges, a total of 1,835 years and three months for that illegal possession of the ammunition charge. And what exactly did Cedric do while the verdict and sentence was being heard? He was reclined in the dock, his head on his arms, asleep. Afterwards, he left the courtroom smiling and was sent straight to CMAX, the maximum security prison in Pretoria where he remains to this day. So I'm sure at this point you're dying for me to get into the mind behind the madness. So let's do it. Honestly, Cedric Marquet is an enigma. It is rare for serial killers to change MOs and to also not have a single particular victim profile. But just because it's rare doesn't mean it can't occur. Cedric's case was also quite a turning point in criminal procedures in South Africa. His was the first serial killing trial in South Africa where the Geographic Information System, GIS, a system that makes use of cartography, statistical analyses, and database technology was used to chart his hunting ground. This technology is usually used to find serial killers, but in his case, it was used as an experiment. It showcased that majority of the murders that Cedric had committed had taken place within 500 meters of his two places of residence, his place of work, as well as his brother and girlfriend's homes. It provided insights into his patterns 
which could prove incredibly useful in later years and cases. What also made his case unique was that it was comprised of two very different profiles. The Wemapan series of attacks and the Hammer series of attacks were made up of such divergent patterns. So that begs to ask the question, because it's not a common occurrence, what could have driven him to change his MOs? Well, Cedric refused to be interviewed and he never really gave any real reason why he did what he did. All he would state while speaking to Bailafalt on one occasion was that he hated people. But if we are to theorize, for interest's sake, let's look at some of his earlier life events and how they may have affected the MOs he later chose. He would later state in conversation that his wife was having affairs with different men and she would take them to the top of the kopi or the hill and there they would sleep together. This could prove interesting in understanding why in many of his attacks, the male victim was often killed and the female victim dragged or chased up a copy before he would exert his power upon her and in this way he was perhaps changing and rewriting his reality potentially even gaining revenge on his wife for her actions. So as a way to start to understand the next group of individuals he attacked, I want to explain that many of the women whom he attacked would fight back, and this would result in his clothing often being ripped. It also came to light that he had an obsession with dressing neatly and well, and this of course involved wearing clothing that did not have tears or marks on it. When asked why he chose tailors in particular, he elaborated that once he had taken his shirt in to be mended, but that tailor did not do a good job, in his eyes. And so, in his mind, he had decided to avenge his torn shirt and take out his anger on all the other tailors at the same time too. Yes, highly illogical to the average person, but in his mind, perhaps a completely normal train of thought. Just as taking revenge on elderly white men was, because of one occasion where an elderly white man had not paid him sufficiently for services rendered. Cedric could not stand when things did not go his way. The thing is though, no matter how much one can sit and analyse the motives of a serial killer, Only they know why they do what they do. In the minds of many serial killers, a blueprint exists and their actions and crimes are often the steps that are taken to turn their fantasy into a reality. Cedric was determined to be in control of every situation and he hated when things did not go his way. So I'm sure you're waiting for me to give the diagnosis of APD or psychopathy but it's not going to come, and here's why. According to a clinical psychologist who worked on the case during the trial, he did not meet all the criteria to be diagnosed as a psychopath, although there were some signs that he was proud of the crimes that he committed, and when he spoke about them, he did so not with regret, but with satisfaction. He didn't care who he killed, and in many ways he could be considered a sadist. And it was evident that he suffered from anger problems. He would later admit that he struggled to control his anger in certain situations, saying that when he was angry, he couldn't even speak. His mind went blank and that anger would only subside once he followed through with his actions, which was attacking or killing someone. Honestly, it's difficult and quite near impossible without having an in-depth analysis of Cedric to understand what spurred all of this on. We know he had a traumatic encounter in his developmental adolescent years with his initiation, which most definitely played a role in the way he began to view others around him. He also had a difficult relationship with his father, a key role player in his culture and family. Perhaps one or both of these incidents played a role in his later development. But if you're familiar with my content by now, you will know that it's never just as simple as blaming one single factor. The motives of many serial killers are primarily psychological, 
but there can often exist a secondary motive, perhaps one for financial gain. This is evident within Cedric's case. He was extremely mission-oriented, aiming to rid society of certain groups and targeting particular individuals, such as tailors, elderly white men, or couples at Wimapan. But his motives were also hedonistic. He gained pleasure from the sexual aspect of his attacks, and money from each of his victims. He doesn't fit into a single mold of what we believe or think a serial killer should be. And I think that's what scares people the most. Because he is not the only one. Serial killers, for the most part, don't often look like anyone out of the ordinary. They could be your friend, your neighbor, your gardener, or even the person you share your bed with. Until next week, stay safe, stay blessed, and stay the amazing human beings that I know each and every single one of you are. Bye!